the second cargo ship carrying close to 400 tons of food leaving Cyprus for Gaza this weekend. It comes after the UN's top court ordered Israel to allow more aid into Gaza, including by opening more land crossings. A recent UN-backed report warns that the risk of famine is imminent in the north and that it could spread to half of Gaza's population by July. David Miliband is the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. He's also a former UK foreign secretary. I spoke to him about the warnings of famine and the challenges of getting aid into Gaza. David Miliband, nice to see you again. Thanks very much for having me on. Want to talk about food insecurity in Gaza to start, uh, growing warnings of, of imminent famine. Your organization, the International Rescue Committee, has called it a profound failure of humanity. What, what are you being told about what is happening on the ground in Gaza right now? Well, we have an emergency medical team at one of the hospitals in Gaza, one of the few remaining hospitals, and we have local partners around Gaza working on the ground, especially with mobile health. But the threat of famine it isn't just anecdote from us. The international phase classification system is a very technical, very technocratic, maybe even a conservative assessment process. And they've said that a million people in Gaza, a million out of 2.2 million, are at imminent risk of uh, famine. That means they're at level five, catastrophic levels of food insecurity. The other 1.2 million people are at level four, which is emergency, and level three, which is crisis. And crisis means you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Hmm. So this food insecurity is really way too diplomatic a term. Yes, for sure. Starvation that some people are already suffering and the threat for many, many more. And what this means for Gazans is that if the fighting doesn't get them, and there are still deaths every day from the fighting, if the fighting doesn't get them, the threat of public health disease, of communicable disease, and of uh, malnutrition, stroke, starvation is very real indeed. Yeah. I guess the frustrating part of, of what you're saying is that this is preventable. There are aid trucks waiting to get in. There is supplies and help for people in Gaza. What is the problem with access there? Why has it not improved? Well, I think that's a really important point. There's obviously a massive political debate going on reached its height at the UN Security Council this week about a ceasefire. And we applaud that decision uh, of the UN Security Council. We want it to be implemented. But it's imperative that the debate and the argument about the ceasefire doesn't obscure the fact that the humanitarian aid needs of the most basic kind need to be met even if the fighting carries on. Right. And the basic problem is very simple. Aid trucks are backed up outside the Rafah crossing. There aren't enough crossings. Aid trucks then have to go through a circuitous route once they're inside the crossing point. They have to drive 40 kilometers south from Rafah to Kerem Shalom uh, to have their, in their cargo inspected. If any item on the truck fails what is called a quote unquote dual use te test. So for okay. example, a pair of medical scissors could be said, well, that could be used by a terrorist group then the whole of the truck gets turned back by the Israeli authorities. Even the trucks that get through, they face blockages in Gaza itself. The Israeli authorities said this week that they would not allow UN or WRA, the UNRWA trucks, to go into the north of Gaza with food. There was a ban on that. They, they said they wouldn't be allowed across. And that's how you in, end up in a situation of the most dramatic acceleration of food insecurity and malnutrition that's ever been seen, five and a half, six months, to reach this catastrophic stage. And so our call is very clear. Yes, proceed with the implementation of the ceasefire resolution, but for goodness sake, get on with the opening up of more crossings, the streamlining of the bureaucracy, the drive to make sure that we're not reduced to fourth and fifth best options of dropping aid from the sky and having a scrum to then see who can get it on the beach. Yeah, well, I did want to ask you about the airdrops because those um, continue. They're obviously trying to build this port in the in the water, but the, the airdrops are, are problems of their own. There are people who, who drowned trying to get to some of that aid um, that was dropped by a plane. I, what is your view on that kind of solution? Obviously, it is not enough, but is it something that, that could help in the short term? Well, we're an international humanitarian aid organization that has experience of the use of airdrops. Uh, the Places that they use are generally places where it's very hard to reach, where there aren't crossing points, uh, where places that are cut off. And even then, it's risky and expensive. Okay. In the Gaza case, 
airdrops are risky and expensive. They also are not a distribution mechanism because yeah. if you listen to anyone who's tried to get a can of tuna from the beach where the aid drops, it, it is a scrum. It, it, it's, it doesn't do any of the work to ensure that aid reaches the right people in the right way uh, according to vulnerability. So we think it is a fourth or fifth best option. If there is to be a medium-term solution of a maritime uh, bridge, a maritime pontoon that can allow more aid to come in, uh, that will take 30 to 60 days to be built. And even that doesn't address the distribution point. What we do know is that the UN authorities and the local NGOs do have mechanisms to reach people. We're doing that ourselves with our own local uh, partners. And there is actually a much, much simpler cheaper, less risky solution, which is to open up the crossings, streamline the bureaucracy, get the aid trucks going. Just listen to this, Rosemary. In February, there was half as much aid reaching Gaza as in January. I'm not comparing it to the pre-October the 7th situation. The amount of aid going in in February was half that in hmm. January. That's what needs to be turned around. Let, let, let me end on this. Obviously, you and I have talked about um, crises, uh, lots of different crises. You, you referenced the speed at which uh, this has unfolded. H how would you compare it to other situations in terms of the desperation and the deteriorating situation? Well, there's an article in the Haaretz Israeli newspaper this week that says death is everywhere. That's the headline of the article in Haaretz. And I'm afraid that is the that's the report, the excruciating reports that we get from our surgical teams in hospitals, from our local partners. Gaza is obviously not the largest population in the world. It's two million people. Uh, the number one country on our emergency watch list of humanitarian aid is um, Sudan, which has 25 million people in humanitarian need. But they are the most densely populated population. They're also a population that suffers the, the greatest strangulation when it comes to the provision of aid. And then a final point, in many other places, Sudan being an example, people can get out. I was in right. South Sudan last month, and 500,000 refugees have fled from Sudan to South Sudan. For people in Gaza, they can't get out either. So aid can't get in, and they can't get out. That is a recipe for the kind of disaster that we've got at the moment. David Miliband, thank you for making the time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.